Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to According to Wikipedia with your host, Bang and Dang. And we told you at the beginning of this, we never know what's going to happen. It's going to be completely random, nothing related from one episode to the next. And boy, the last episodes, last three episodes couldn't be truer. Well, the Climate change. Second to her. No. Sexual intercourse. I guess not, yeah. And now this week we're moving on to <laughs> the uh, Hobbit book. Mm. Written oh. by uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. I guess that's how you pronounce his name. I thought I was always Tolkien. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never read the book. Nope. And I don't think I've ever even seen the movie. Nope. And I've definitely never seen any of the uh, Lord of the Rings. So. Nope. Well, that's a different writer. Not. It's the sequel to The Hobbit. The Lord of the Rings is. Oh, Harry Potter. Right. I don't know why you, you did this last week, too. Uh, <laughs> the Hobbit, or otherwise called There and Back Again. I'm sure in, like, UK or something, it's are weird like that. It's a children's fantasy novel by English author J.R.R. R. Tolkien, published in 1937 to wide critical acclaim, being nominated for the Carnegie Medal and was awarded a prize from the New York Herald Tribune, for best juvenile fiction. The book is recognized as a classic in ch children's literature and is one of the best-selling books of all time with over 100 million copies worldwide sold. There's only six books in history that sold over 100 million copies. Charles Dickens. Uh, Tale of Two Cities, never heard of it. Uh, Little Prince, heard of that. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which we're too stupid over here in uh, America that we had to change it to Sorcerer's Stone. Right. Um, and, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. And Dream of Red Chamber. Kiao, Xiao, Zukin, Zukin. The Lion in the Witch in the Wardrobe. Look at all these freaking the fantasy Hobbit. books. Where's the uh, Christmas Girl? Dude, look at all J.K. Rowling. She's like, bang, 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 bang. Uh, she never has to write again in her whole life. Christmas Girl didn't sell that many? Well, I mean, it's about Christmas and stuff, though. Doesn't so. matter. Really? Not even 20? No. Jaws? Jaws was a book before the, uh, or did it come after the movie? 74. Christmas Carol, 1843, you wrote that? The first run of 6,000 copies sold out by Christmas Eve. By the end of 1844, 11 more editions had been released. I don't think it sold that many, because after a year, the profits were only 744 euros or whatever that is. He was deeply disappointed. And he was deeply disappointed. Uh -huh. Oh, man. I wonder if his estate's getting any money off of all the adaptations they've done off of this. If it says Charles Dickens on it. Interesting. Yeah, but there's only six books sold over 100 million copies. It's crazy. Um, Bilbo Baggins, who is the protagonist of this book, is a respectable, reserved, and well-to-do hobbit, a race resembling short humans with furry, leathery feet who live in underground houses, and are mainly pastoral farmers and gardeners. Gandalf, you shall not pass. Is that what that is? I don't know. Oh, an itinerant wizard introduces Bilbo to a company of 13 dwarves. Thorin Oakenshield is a proud, pompous head of the company of dwarves and heir to the destroyed dwarfish kingdom under the Lonely Mountain. Smog is a dragon who long ago pillaged the dar dwarfish kingdom, dwarfish kingdom of Thorin's grandfather and sleeps upon the vast treasure. Oh, oh man. Oh, I'm guessing we're going to have to fight some dragons, huh? The little Lord of, Lord of the Ring people are going to be like, you don't know how to right. pronounce all these names, right? Man, what is up with the English and uh, making these weird fantasy stuff like that with trolls living underground and witches and witch, wizards wizard, and all yeah. that shit? Crazy you know. stuff, man. Wasn't the Princess Diaries... Was that guy by an English man, too? I don't know. I wouldn't doubt it. Makes sense. Well, the plot of the book involves a host of other characters of varying importance, such as 12 other dwarves of the company. Two types of elves, both puckish and more serious warrior types. Men. Okay, some men. In regular, there. Right, regular, regular men, I guess. We got some man-eating trolls. We got a boulder-throwing giants. We got evil cave dwelling goblins. Damn. We got forest dwelling giant spiders who can speak. Oh shit. We also have immense and heroic eagles who also speak. 
We got evil wolves or wargs, as they called, uh, who are allied with the goblins. Then we got Elrond, the sage, Gollum, a strange creature inhabiting an underground lake, Bjorn, a man who can assume bear form. Hey, that's awesome. Then you got uh, Bard the Bowman, who is a grim but honorable archer of Lake Town. Fantastic. All right. One of my favorite is. All right. Well, uh, spoiler alert. If you guys have never read The Hobbit, guess what? You're about to see everything that just happened. Because we are going to go through the plot. Gandalf tricks Bilbo Baggins. And I thought Gandalf was a good guy. I don't know. Gandalf tricks Bilbo Baggins into hosting a party for Thorin Oakenshield and his band of 12 dwarves, who are Dwalin, Balin, Keely, Feely, oh no, Dory, Nori, Ori, Owen, Owen, Oin, Gloin, Biffer. Bofer and Bomber, <laughs> who go over plans reclaiming their ancient home, Lonely Mountain, and its vast treasure from the dragon Smog. Uh oh. Gandalf unveils Thor's map, showing a secret door into the mountain, and proposes that the dumbfounded Bilbo, Bilbo, Bimbo, Bilbo, serve as the expedition's burglar. Hey. The dwarves ridicule the idea, but Bilbo, indignant, joins despite himself. Why not? Uh, I think is it to spite himself yeah. is, or despite himself. Uh, despite himself. Uh, the group travels into the wild. Gandalf saves the company from trolls and leads them to Rivendell. Fantastic. Where Elrond reveals more secrets from the map. Oh. When they attempt to cross the Misty Mountains, they are caught by goblins and driven deep underground. Oh no! Although Gandalf rescues them, Bilbo gets separated from the others as they flee the goblins. Of course he does. Lost in the goblin tunnels, he stumbles across a mysterious ring and then encounters Gollum who engages him in a game, each posing a riddle until one of them cannot solve it. Oh, okay. All right. Don't they got a board game of this, too? I don't know. Well, if Bilbo wins, Gollum will slow. <laughs> Gollum will show him the way out of the tunnels, of course. I mean, I would I would expect that, right? But if Bilbo fails, his life will be forfeit. Well, that's not a fair trade. With the help of the ring, which comfort... Which confers invisibility. Bilbo escapes and rejoins the dwarves, improving his reputation with them. The goblins and wargs give chase, but the company are saved by eagles. They rest in the house of Bjorn. The company enters the dark forest of Mirkwood without Gandalf, who has other responsibilities. <laughs> hey guys, I got. He's like, I gotta, I gotta, uh, gotta meet this hot chick. Right. In Mirkwood, Bilbo first saves the dwarves from giant spiders. And then from a dungeons of, from the dungeons of the wood elves, nearing the lonely mountain, the travelers are welcomed by the human inhabitants of Lake Town, who hope the dwarves will fulfill prophecies of Smog's demise. The expedition reaches the mountain and finds the secret door. The dwarves send a reluctant Bilbo inside to scout the dragon. So he's like, "Dude, I already just got lost and I was killed. <laughs> I was forfeited my life." <laughs> well, he steals a great cup, and while conversing with Smog. Sports a gap in the ancient dragon's armor. Oh. Or spots a gap. The enraged dragon, deducing that Lake Town has aided the intruders, flies off to destroy the town. Oh, shit. A thrush overhears Bilbo's report of Smog's vulnerability and tells Lake Town resident Bard. Smog wrecks havoc on, havoc on the town until Bard shoots an arrow into the chink in Smog's armor. Oh, little, no. Yeah, he's carrying a little Chinese guy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, guys. Right. Uh, killing the dragon. <laughs> When the dwarves take possession of the mountain, Bilbo finds the Arkenstone, which is the most treasured heirloom of the Thorns family, and hides it away. The wood elves and the lake men request compensation for Lake Town's destruction and settlement of old claims on the treasure. When Thorn refuses to give them anything, they besiege the mountain. Uh -oh. oh, no. However, Thorn manages to send a message to his kinfolk in the Iron Hills and reinforces his position. Bilbo slips out and gives the Arkenstone to the besiegers, hoping to head off at war. Heed off, right? Heed, hoping sure. to hoping to heed off a war. When they offered when they offered the jewel to Thorin in exchange for treasure, Bilbo reveals how they obtained it. Thorin, furious at what he sees as betrayal, banishes Bilbo, and battle seems inevitable. When Dane Ironfoot, Thorin's second cousin, arrives with an army of dwarf warriors. Oh, that'd be a nice little army. <laughs> Gandalf reappears to warn all of their approaching army of goblins and wargs. The dwarves, men, and elves band together, but only with the timely arrival of the eagles and and Bjorn do they do they win in the climatic battle of the five armies. Yeah, you gotta have that bear slash human guy come in and tear some shit up. Thorin is fatally wounded though, and reconciles with Bilbo before he dies. Aww. Bilbo accepts only a small portion of his share of the treasure, having no want or need for more. 
but still returns home a very wealthy hobbit. Roughly a year later, roughly a year and a month after his first left. Years later, he writes the story of his adventures. Which is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> is it this? Oh, yeah, uh, it's the Red Book of Westmarch, apparently. No, oh, okay. Good for him. Damn, he did Beowulf, too? I don't know. Good for him. Okay. You next sounds kind of interesting. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. I bet you the movie is way better I think than the, the book. Like three hours long. I bet it is. Uh, a little background information on this. In the early 30s, Tolkien was pursuing an academic career at Oxford as Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon with a fellowship at Pembroke College. Several of his poems have been published in magazines and small collections, including Goblin Feet and The Cat and the Fiddle, a nursery rhyme undone and its scandalous secret unlocked. A reworking of the nursery rhyme, Hey Diddle Diddle. Uh, his creative endeavors at this time also included letters from Father Christmas to his children, Aww. illustrated manuscripts that featured warring gnomes and goblins, and a helpful polar bear. Why not? Alongside the creation of elven languages and an attendant mythology, including the Book of Lost Tales, which he had been creating since 1917. These works all saw a posthumous publication. Oh, that's fantastic. 1955, a letter to W.H. Auden. Tolkien recollects that he began to work on The Hobbit one day early in the 1930s. When he was marking school certificate papers, he found a blank page. Suddenly inspired, he wrote the words, In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. I mean, that's how you would start a I guess, book. right? By late 1932, he had finished the story and then sent the manuscript to several friends, including C.S. Lewis and a student of Tolkien's named Elaine Griffiths. He was banging her. Yeah, he wanted to. <laughs> 1936, when Griffiths was visited in Oxford by Susan Dagnall, a staff member of the publisher George Allen and Unwin. She was reported to have either lent Dagnall the book or suggested she borrow it from Tolkien. In any event, Dagnall was impressed by it and showed the book to Stanley Unwin, who then asked his 10-year-old son, Rainer, to review it. Yeah. Rainer's favorable comments settled Allen and Unwin's decision to publish Tolkien's book. Oh, wow, when is he dead? 1936. Where did he die? He died in 1973. Oh, so he's good. He was okay. Damn, 92 to 73. I'd say he lived a good, pretty good life. 80 years. Right. 81 years. Good for him. The setting of The Hobbit, was, as described on its original dust jacket, is an ancient time between the age of fairy and the dominion of men in an unnamed fantasy world. The world is shown on the end paper map as western lands, westward and wilderland as the east. Originally, this world was self-contained, but as Tolkien began work on The Lord of the Rings, he decided these stories could fit into the legendarium that he had been working on privately for decades. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings became the end of the Third Age of Middle-earth within Arda. I don't know what any of that means. Eventually, these tales of the earlier periods became published as the Silmarillion and other posthumous works. Okay. Well, one of the greatest influences of Tolkien was 19th century arts and crafts polymath William Morris. Tolkien wished to imitate Morris's prose and poetry romances, following the general style and approach of the work. Desolation of smog as portraying dragons as detrimental to landscape has been noted as an explicit motif borrowed from Morris. Tolkien wrote, also being impressed by as a boy, by Samuel Rutherford Crackett's historical novel, The Black Douglas, and of basing the necromancer, whoa, the necromancer Soren on its villain, Gills de Retz. Don't know any of these books. Nope. Incidents in both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are similar in narrative and style to the novel. Of Black oh, Douglas? Right. Yeah. And its overall style and imagery have been suggested as having an influence on Tolkien as well. All right. Well, Tolkien's portrayal of goblins in The Hobbit was particularly influenced by George MacDonald's The Princess and the Goblin. Oh. However, MacDonald's influence on Tolkien was more profound than the shaping of individual characters and episodes. His works further helped Tolkien form his whole thinking on the role of fantasy within his Christian faith. Oh, no shit. Well, this dude was a Christian writing about this. Wow. Though. That's crazy. The Tolkien scholar Mark T. Hooker has cataloged a lengthy series of parallels between The Hobbit and Jules Verne's 1864 Journey to the Center of the Earth. These include, among other things, a hidden runic message and a celestial alignment that direct the adventurers 
to the goals of their requests. No, of their quests. Tolkien's works show many influences from Norse mythology, reflecting his lifelong passion for those stories and his academic interest in Germanic philology. Philology. Oh, look at that. The Hobbit is no exception to this. The work shows influences from Northern European literature, myths, and languages, especially from the poetic Edda and the prose Edda. <laughs> okay. Examples include the names of the characters, such as Feely, Keely, Owen, Glowin, <laughs> Biffer, Bofer, Bomber, Dory, Nori, Dwalin, Balin, Dane, Nain. Dude, this guy is so unoriginal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thorin, Oakenshield, and Gandalf, deriving from the old Norse names Feely, Keely, Owen, Glowy, Bevor, <laughs> Bevor, Bomber, Dory, Nori, Dvalin, or Valen, Blaine, Dane, Nain, Porn, Ekenskialdi, <laughs> uh, and Gandalf. Damn it. Uh, those Scandinavian names, dude. Crazy. But while their names are from Old Norse, the characters of the dwarves are more directly taken from fairy tales, such as Snow White and the, S and the Snow White and Rose. Such as Snow White and Snow White and Rose Red, as collected by the Brothers Grimm. Okay. What is that? They created Snow White. I know, but what is Rose Red? Is that her sister? Probably. Rose Red, she's wearing Rose. That's not related to Snow White. The two girls, the bear, and the dwarf. But this is not related to Snow White, apparently. Okay. Huh. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the latter tale may also have been influenced, uh, may have... Oh, because Snow White got the hyphen and the other Snow White don't. Right. Uh, the latter tale may also have influenced the character of Bjorn. Tolkien's use of descriptive names such as Misty Mountains and Bag End echoes the names used in Old Norse sagas. Makes sense. I don't know why Bag End would be descriptive. But okay. Right. The names of dwarf-friendly ravens such as Roke are derived from Old Norse words for raven and rook. But their peaceful characters are unlike the typical carrion birds from Nor Old Norse and Old English literature. No, there's some ravens are dinks. Yeah. Tolkien well, is... I don't know about that. They're one of the smartest birds out there, but... Yeah, but they're dinks. You know what that means? Dink? Assholes. Well, that, they're dinks. I mean, stupid, but... They're not stupid. That's what dink means. Dink doesn't mean asshole. Oh, dink means you're a dink. Be a dink. Yeah, you dink, you dummy. Yeah, you dummy. Right. You dink. Right. How does that mean, asshole? Well, same thing. Oh. Yeah, asshole. Tolkien is not simply skimming historical sources for effect. The juxtaposition of old and new styles of expression is seen by Tolkien scholar Tom Shippey. Dude, how many scholar? How many guys have studied this guy? Right. As one of the major themes explored in The Hobbit. Maps figure in both saga literature and The Hobbit. Hmm? What's Maps. Maps that he had in his book. Oh, that's cool. The guy, this guy had way too much time in his hands. <laughs> Several of the author's illustrations incorporate Ang Anglo-Saxon runes, an English adaptation of the Germanic runic alphabets. Hmm. Runes? Runes. Themes from Old English literature, and specifically from Beowulf, shaped the ancient world which Bilbo stepped into. Tolkien, a scholar of Beowulf, counted the epic among his most valued sources for The Hobbit. Tolkien was one of the first critics to treat Beowulf as a literary work with beyond with value beyond the merry his, merely historical with his 1936 lecture Beowulf the monsters and the critics. Tolkien borrowed several elements from Beowulf including a monstrous intelligent dragon. Hmm. Certain descriptions in the Hobbit seem to have been lifted straight out of Beowulf with some minor rewording such as when the dragon stretches its neck out to sniff for its intruders. Well, I mean, come on, right. Likewise, Tolkien's descriptions of the lair as excess through a secret passage, mirror those in Beowulf. Other specific plot elements and features in The Hobbit that show similarities to Beowulf include the title of Thief, as Bilbo is called by Gollum, and later by Schmog, and Schmog's personality, which leads to destruction of Lake Town. Tolkien refines parts of Beowulf's plot that he appears to have found less than satisfactorily described, such as details about the cup thief and the dragon's intellect and personality. <sighs> Another influence from Old English sources is the appearance of named blades of renown adorned with ruins. Runes? And uh, using his elf blade, Bilbo finally takes his first independent heroic action. By his name in the blade, Sting, we see Bilbo's acceptance of the kinds of cultural and linguistic practices found in Beowulf, signifying his entrance into the ancient world in which he found himself. 
This progression culminates in Bilbo stealing a cup from the dragon's horde, rousing him to wrath, an incident directly mirroring Beowulf, and an action entirely determined by traditional narrative patterns. As Tolkien wrote, the episode of the theft arose naturally, and almost inevitably, from the circumstances. It is difficult to think of any other way of conducting the story at this point. Hmm. I fancy the author of Beowulf would say much the same. The name of the word of uh, the name of the wizard Radagast is taken from the name of the Slavic deity Radagast. <laughs> okay. okay. Fantastic. Reputation of the dwarves in the Hobbit was influenced by his, his own selective reading of medieval texts regarding the Jewish people and their history. The dwarves' characteristics of being dispossessed of their ancient homeland at the Lonely Mountain and living among other groups whilst retaining their own culture are all derived from medieval images of Jews. And all the way up to like 1940. Whilst their warlike nature stems from accounts in the Hebrew Bible. The dwarvish calendar invented for the Hobbit reflects the Jewish calendar, which begins in late autumn. And although Tolkien denied that he used allegory, the dwarves taking Bilbo out of his complacent existence has been seen as an eloquent metaphor for the impoverishment of Western society without Jews. Okay, well, as we stated before, George Allen and Unwin published the first edition of The Hobbit on September 21st, 1937, with a print run of 1,500 copies, which sold out by December because of enthusiastic reviews. This first printing was illustrated in black and white by Tolkien, who designed the dust jacket as well. Look for him. Houghton Mifflin of Boston and New York reset type for an American edition to be released early in 1938, in which four of the illustrations would be color plates. Oh, hey. Allen and Unwin decided to incorporate the color illustrations into their second printing, released at the end of 1937. Despite the book's popularity, paper rationing due to World War II and not ending until 1949 meant that the Allen and Unwin edition of the book was often unavailable during this period. Ooh, so if you got one of those copies, All right. I bet you know, it was worth some money. Mm. Subsequent editions in English were published in 1951, 1966, 1978, 1995. Jeez. Numerous English language editions of The Hobbit has been produced by several publishers making it one of the best-selling books of all time, with over 100 million copies sold by the year 2012. In addition, The Hobbit has been translated into over 60 languages, with more than one published version for some languages. December 1937, The Hobbit's publisher Stanley Unwin asked Tolkien for a sequel. In response, Tolkien provided drafts for The Silmarillion, but the editors rejected them, believing that the public wanted more about Hobbits. Right. Probably they did. did. They did. Well, Tolkien subsequently began work on the new Hobbit, which would eventually become The Lord of the Rings. A course that would not only change the context of the original story, but lead to substantial changes to the character of Gollum. I mean, whatever. In the first edition of The Hobbit, Gollum willingly bets his magic ring on the outcome of the, of the riddle game. And he and Bilbo part amicably. <laughs> In second edition, the ed edits uh, to reflect the new concept of the One Ring and its corrupting abilities. Tolkien made Gollum more aggressive towards Bilbo and destroy it, losing the ring. And then Counter ends with Gollum's curse. Thief! 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 Baggins! We hate it! We hate it! We hate it forever! Okay. This presages Gollum's portrayal in The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien sent this revised version of the chapter, Riddles in the Dark, to Unwin as an example of the kinds of changes needed to bring the book into conformity with the Lord of the Rings. But he heard nothing back for years. Wow. Well, when he was sent galley proofs of a new edition, uh, edition, Tolkien was surprised to find the sample text had been incorporated. In the Lord of the Rings, the original version of the Riddle game is explained as a lie made up by Bilbo under the harmful influence of the ring, whereas the revised version contains the true account. The revised text became the second edition published in 1951 in both the UK and US. Tolkien began a new version in 1960, attempting to adjust the tone of The Hobbit to its sequel. See, why? I know. Uh, he abandoned... Why don't you do your sequel to The freaking Hobbit? He abandoned the new revision at Chapter 3 after he received criticism that it just wasn't The Hobbit. Right. Implying it had lost much of its lighthearted tone and quick pace. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm. After an unauthorized paperback edition of The Lord of the Rings appeared from Ace Books in 1965, Houghton Mifflin and Ballantine asked Tolkien to refresh the next the text of The Habit to renew the U.S. copyright. Uh, this text became the 1966 third edition. Tolkien took the opportunity to align the narrative even more closely 
to the Lord of the Rings and to cos- cosmological developments from his unpublished Quenta Sil- Silmarillion as it stood at the time. These small edits included, for example, changing the phrase elves that are now called gnomes from the first and second editions on page 63 to high elves of the West, my kin in the third edition. High elves of the West, my kin. Okay, whatever. Okay. Tolkien had used gnome in his earlier writing to refer to the second kindred of the high elves, the Noldor, or deep elves, thinking that gnome derived from the Greek uh, Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, and he thought it was a good name for the wisest of the elves. Right. However, because of the common denotation of a garden gnome, right, uh, derived from the 16th century Paracelsus, Paracelsus, uh, Tolkien abandoned the term. He also changed tomatoes to pickles, but retained other <laughs> anachronisms, such as clocks and tobacco. All right. In The Lord of the Rings, he has Mary, spelled M-E-R-R-Y, explained that tobacco had been brought from the West by the Numenorians. Okay. All right. Since the author's death, two critical editions of The Hobbit have been published, providing commentary on the creation amendation and development of the text in the annotated hobbit douglas anderson provides the text of the published book alongside commentary and illustrations later editions added to the text of the quest of erebor Erebor. anderson's commentary makes note of the sources tolkien brought together in preparing for the text and chronicles the changes that tolkien made to the published editions the text is also accompanied by illustrations from foreign language editions among them work by tove jansen jansen with the history of the hobbit published in two parts in 2007 john d ratliff provides the full text of the earliest and intermediary drafts of the books alongside commentary that shows relationships to tolkien scholarly and creative works both contemporary and later ratliff provides the abandoned 1960s retelling and previous previously unpublished illustrations by tolkien the book separates commentary from tolkien's text although the reader Allowing the reader to read the original drafts of self-contained stories. Okay. Oh, wow. Tolkien's correspondence and publisher's records show that he was involved in the design and illustration of the entire book. Oh, that's nice. All elements were the subject of considerable correspondence and fussing over by Tolkien. Rainer Unwin, in his publishing memoir comments, 1937, alone Tolkien wrote 26 letters to George Allen and Unwin. Detailed, fluent, often pungent, but infinitely polite and exasperatingly precise. I doubt any author today, however famous, would get such scrupulous attention. Even of the maps, or even the maps of which Tolkien originally proposed five were considered and debated. He wished Thor's map to be tipped in, that is, glued in after the book had been found, or been bound, at the first mention in the text, and with the moon letter, Surth, on the reverse so they could be seen when held up to the light. In the end, the cost as well as the shading of the maps, which would be difficult to reproduce, resulted in the final design of two maps as end papers. Yep. Thor's map and the map of Wild- Wilderland, both printed in the black and red on the paper's cream back- uh, background. Good for them. Well, that's nice. Well, originally, Alan and Unwin planned to illustrate the book only with the end paper maps, but Tolkien's first tendered sketches so charmed the publisher's staff that they opted to include them without raising the book's price, despite the extra cost. Thus encouraged, Tolkien supplied a second batch of illustrations. The publishers accepted all of these as well, giving the first edition ten black and white illustrations, plus the two end paper maps. Oh, that's nice. The illustrated scenes were The Hill, Hobbiton Across the Water, The Trolls, The Mountain Path, The Misty Mountains Looking West from the Eerie Towards uh, Goblin Gate, Bjorn's Hall. You also have Mirkwood. Then you have the Elf King's Gate. And then you got Lake Town, the Front Gate, and the Hall at Bag End. All but one of the illustrations were a full page. And one, the Mirkwood illustration, we created a separate plate. Oh, that's oh, nice. Look at that. Satisfied with his skills, the publishers asked Tolkien to design a dust jacket as well. This project, too, became the subject of many iterations and much correspondence with Tolkien always writing disparagingly of his own ability to draw. The runic inscription around the edges of the illustration are a phonetic transliteration of English, given the title of the book and details of the author and publisher. The original jacket design contains several shades of various colors, but Tolkien redrew it several times using fewer colors each time. His final design consisted of four colors. 
The publishers, mindful of the cost, removed the red from the sun to end up with the only black, blue, and green ink on white stock. Oh, whatever. Then the publisher's production staff designed a binding, but Tolkien objected to several elements. Through several er- iterations, the final design ended up as mostly the author's. Oh, that's nice. The spine shows runes. Two B runes? Uh, two uh, Thrain Thor runes, and one D for door. The front and back covers were mirror images of each other, with an elongated elongated dragon characteristic of Tolkien's style stamped along the lower edge, and with a sketch of the Misty Mountains stamped along the upper edge. Once illustrations were approved for the book, Tolkien proposed color plates as well. The publisher would not relent on this, so Tolkien pinned his hopes on the American edition to be published about six months later. Houghton Mifflin rewarded these hopes with the replacement of the front frontispiece, the hill, Hobbiton across the water, in color, and the addition of the new color plates. Oh. Rivendell, Bilbo woke up with the early sun in his eyes. Oh. Bilbo comes to the huts of the raft elves and conversation with Smog, which features a dwarvish curse written on Tolkien's invented script, Tengwar, and signed with two TH runes, which is a symbol, looks like a P and a B put together, I guess. Right. Uh, the additional illustrations proved so appealing that George Allen and Unwin adopted the color plates as well for their second printing. Yeah, you should have just done it in the first place, pussies. Right. With the exception of Bilbo woke up with our sun in his early <laughs> eyes, or early sun in his eyes. Oh, my. Jeez. Different editions have been illustrated in diverse ways. Many follow the original scheme, at least loosely. But many others are illustrated by other artists, especially the many translated editions. Some cheaper editions, particularly paperback, are not illustrated except with maps. The Children's Books Club edition of 1942 includes the black and white pictures, but no maps. An anomaly. Tolkien's use of runes, both as decorative devices and as magical signs within the story, has been cited as a major cause for the popularization of runes within New Age and esoteric esoteric literature, stemming from Tolkien's popularity with the elements of counterculture in the 1970s. Well, The Hobbit takes cues from narrative models of children's literature, as shown by its om, omni, omniscient, um, omniscient, omniscient narrator, narrator and characters that young children can relate to, such as the small, food-obsessed, and morally ambiguous Bilbo. The text emphasizes the relationship between time and narrative progress, and it openly distinguishes safe from dangerous in its geography. Both are the key elements of works intended for children, as is the home away from home, as is the home away home or there and back again plot structure typical of the Bill Dung's Groman. While Tolkien later claimed to dislike the aspect of the narrative voice addressing the reader dire- directly, the narrative voice contributes significantly to the success of the novel. Emmer O'Sullivan, in her comparative children's literature, notes The Hobbit as one of a handful of children's books that have been accepted into mainstream literature alongside Alongside, alongside Joe Stein Garter's Sophie's World in 1991, and of course, 137 Harry Potter books. Crazy. Tolkien intended The Hobbit as a fairy story, and wrote it in a tone suited to addressing children. Although he said later that the book was not specifically written for children, but had rather been created out of his interest in mythology and legend. Many of the initial reviews referred to the work as a fairy story. However, according to Zach Zipes, writing in the Oxford Companion to Fairy Tales, Bilbo is an atypical character for a fairy tale. The work is much longer than Tolkien's ideal proposed in his essay on fairy stories. Many fairy tale moppets, such as the repetition of similar events seen in the dwarves' arrival at Bilbo's and Baron's homes, and folklore themes such as trolls turning to stone, are to be found in this very story. <laughs> Uh, the book is popularly popul- popularly called and often marketed as a fantasy novel, but like Peter Pan and Wendy by J.M. Barry and The Princess and the Goblin by George MacDonald, both of which influenced Tolkien and contained fantasy elements, it is primarily identified as being children's literature. Right. The two genres are not mutually exclusive, so some definitions of high fantasy include works for children by authors such as L. Frank Baum and Lloyd Alexander alongside the works of Gene Wolfe and Jonathan Swift, which are which are more often considered adult literature. Okay. The Hobbit has been called the most popular of all 20th century fantasies ever written for children. Jane Chance, however, considers the book to be a children's novel only in the sense that it appeals to the child in an adult reader. 
Whatever. Sullivan credits the first publication of The Hobbit as an important step in the development of high fantasy. And further credits the 1960 paperback debut of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings as essential to the creation of a mass market for fiction of this kind, as well as the fantasy genre's current status. <sighs> Tolkien's prose is unpretentious and straightforward, taken as given the existence of his imaginary world and describing in details its details in a matter-of-fact way while often introducing the new and fantastic in an almost casual manner. This down-to-earth style also found in later fantasies such as Richard Adams' Watership Down, Peter Beagle's The Last Unicorn, accepts readers into the fictional world rather than conjoling or attempting to convince them of its reality. While The Hobbit is written in a simple, friendly language, each of its characters has a unique voice. The narrator, who occasionally interrupts the narrative flow with asides, a device common to both children's and Anglo-Saxon literature, has his own linguistic style, linguistic style separate from those of the main characters. Okay. All right. Fantastic. How do we know? Right. It's however you determine how they're sounding in your head. Right. The basic form of the story is that of a quest told in episodes. For the most part of the book, each chapter introduces a different denizen of the wilderland, some helpful and friendly towards the protagonists and others threatening or dangerous. However, the general tone is kept lighthearted, being interspersed with songs and humor. One example of use of song to maintain tone is when Thorn and company are kidnapped by goblins, who, when marching them into the underworld, sing, Clap, snap, the black crack, grip, grab, pinch, nab, and down, down to goblin town you go, my lad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's how the song goes, I don't know guys. either. This... <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we can get a, a rendition. Clip, clap. All right. Never watched that movie. No. (laughs) This anamatopoeic singing undercuts the dangerous scene with a sense of humor. Right. Tolkien achieves his balance of humor and danger through other means as well, as seen in the foolishness and cockney dialect of the trolls and in the drunkenness of the elven captors. You know, they always have, like, the stupid dwarf or something. The general form, that of a journey into strange lands, told in a lighthearted mood and interspersed with songs, maybe following the model of the Icelandic journals, by William Morris, an important literary influence on Tolkien. All right. Well, the evolution and maturation of the protagonist, Bilbo Baggins, is central to the story. This journey of maturation, where Bilbo gains a clear sense of identity and confidence in the outside world, may be seen in psychological terms as a Bildungsroman rather than a traditional quest. The Jungian concept of in Individuation? The Jungian concept of individuation is also reflected through its theme of growing maturity and capability, with the author contrasting Bilbo's personal growth against the rest of development of the dwarves. Thus, while Gandalf exerts a parental influence over Bilbo early on, it is Bilbo who gradually takes over leadership of the party, a fact that dwarves could not bear to acknowledge. The analog of the underworld and the hero returning from with, from it with a boon, such as the ring or elvish blades, that benefits society is to, uh, seen to fit the mythic archetypes regarding the initiation and male coming of age as described by Joseph Campbell. Chance compares the 
who's Chance now? Mm. Chance compares the development and growth of Bilbo against other characters to the concepts of just kingship versus sinful kingship derived from the Anne Crean Wiss, which Tolkien had written on in 1929, and a Christian understanding of Beowulf, a text that influenced Tolkien's writing. All right. Shippy, that one guy that we had earlier, I think. Sure. Shippy comments that Bilbo is nothing like a king and that Chance's talk of types just muddies the water. Ooh, we got some, uh, we got some beef in, uh, in Hobbit world. <laughs> Hobbit uh, study year guys. Right, although he does agree with her that there are self-images of Tolkien throughout this fiction. And she is right, too, in seeing Middle-earth as a balance between creativity and scholarship. Germanic past and Christian present is also what they say. Their overcoming of greed and selfishness has been seen as the center, central moral of the story. Whilst greed is a recurring theme in the novel, with many of the episodes stemming from one or more of the characters' simple desire for food, be it trolls eating dwarves or dwarves eating wood elf fare, or a desire for beautiful objects such as gold and jewels. It is only by the Arkenstone's influence upon Thorin that greed and its attendant vices, coveting and malignancy, mal- malignancy come fully to the fore in the story and provide the morale crew of the tale. Bilbo steals the Arkenstone, a most ancient relic of the dwarves, and attempts to ransom it to Thorin for peace. However, Thorin turns on the Hobbit as a traitor, disregarding all the promises and at-your-services he had previously bestowed. In the end, Bilbo gives up the precious stone and most of his share of the treasure to help those in greater need. Tolkien also explores the motif of jewels that inspire intense greed that corrupts those who covet them in Silmarillion, hmm. and there are connections between the words Arkenstone and Silmaril in Tolkien's invented etymologies. The Hobbit employs themes of animism, an important concept in an important concept in anthropology and child development. Animism is the idea that all things, including inanimate objects and natural events such as storms or purses, as well as living things like animals and plants, they all possess human like intelligence. Okay. John D. Ratcliffe calls this the Doctor Doolittle theme in the history of the Hobbit. And he also cites the multitude of talking animals as indicative Indicative of this theme. These talking creatures include ravens, a thrush, spiders, and alongside goblins and elves. Patrick Curry notes that animism is also found in Tolkien's other works and mentions the roots of mountains and feet of trees and the Hobbit as a linguistic, a linguistic shifting and level from the inanimate to animate. Tolkien saw the idea of animism as closely linked to the emergence of human language and myth, saying the first men to talk of the first men to talk of trees and stars saw things very differently. To them, the world was alive with mythological beings. To them, the whole of creation was myth-woven and elf-patterned. As in plot and setting, Tolkien brings his literary theories to bear, informing characters and their interactions. He portrays Bilbo as a modern anachronism, exploring an essentially antique world. Bilbo is able to negotiate and interact within this antique world because language and tradition make connections between the two worlds. For example, Gollum's riddles are taken from old historical sources, while those of Bilbo come from modern nursery books. It is the form of the riddle game, familiar to both, which allow Gallo and Bilbo to engage each other, rather than the content of the riddles themselves. (laughs) <laughs> this idea of a superficial contrast between characters' individual linguistic, <laughs> linguistic style, tone, and sphere of interest leading to an understanding of the deeper unity between the ancient and modern is a recurring theme in The Hobbit. Smog is the main antagonist. In many ways, the Smog episode reflects and references the dragon and Beowulf, and Tolkien uses the episode to put in practice some of the groundbreaking literary theories that he had developed about the old English poem and its portrayal of the dragon as having bestial intelligence. Okay. Bestial? Bestial? Uh, Tolkien greatly prefers this motif over the later medieval trend of using the dragon as a symbolic or allegorical figure, such as in the legend of St. George. Oh, that's fantastic. Smog the dragon, with his golden horde, may be seen as an example of the traditional relationship between evil and metallurgy, as collated in the depiction of Panamonium 
with its belched fire and rolling smoke in John Milton's Paradise Lost. Of all the characters, Smog's speech is the most modern, using idioms such as, don't let your imagination run away with you. Well, just as Tolkien's literary theories have been seen to influence the tale, so have Tolkien's experiences. The Hobbit may be read as Tolkien's parable of World War I, with the hero being plucked from his rural home and thrown into a far-off war where traditional types of heroism are shown to be futile. The tale, <laughs> the tale as such explores the theme of heroism. As Janet Brennan Croft notes, Tolkien's literary reaction to war at this time differed from post-war writers by eschewing irony as a method for distancing events and instead using mythology to mediate his experiences. Similarities to the works of other writers who faced the Great War are seen in The Hobbit, including portraying warfare as an as anti-pastoral in the desolation of smog, both the area under the influence of smog before his demise and the setting for the Battle of the Five Armies later are described as barren, damaged landscapes. Hobbit makes a warning against repeating the tragedies of World War I, and Tolkien's attitude as a veteran may well be summed up by Bilbo's, Bilbo, Bilbo's comment, Victory, after all, I suppose. Well, it seems a very gloomy business. On the first publication in October 1937, The Hobbit was met with almost unanimously favorable reviews from the publications both in the UK and the United States, including the Times, the Catholic Word, World, and the New York Post. C.S. Lewis, a friend of Tolkien and later author of the Chronicles of Narnia between 1949 and 1954, he says, writing in the Times, the truth is that in this book, a number of good things, never before united, have come together. A fund of humor, an understanding of children, and a happy fusion of the scholars with the poet's grasp of mythology. The professor has the air of inventing nothing. He has studied trolls and dragons at first hand, and describes them with that fidelity that is worth oceans of glib originality. C.S. Lewis, 1947. Lewis compares the book to Alice in Wonderland in that both children and adults may find different things to enjoy in it and places alongside... Um, and places it alongside Flatland, Fantasties, <laughs> and The Wind in the Willows. Uh-huh. W.H. Auden, in his review of the sequel, The Fellowship of the Ring, calls The Hobbit one of the best children's stories of this century. No shit. Auden was later to correspond with Tolkien, and they became friends. Uh-huh. The Hobbit was nominated for the Carnegie Medal and awarded a prize from the New York Herald Tribune for Best Juvenile Fiction of the Year in 1938. More recently, the book has also been recognized as most important 20th century novel for older readers oh. in the Children's Book of the Century poll and Books for Keeps. What? Uh-huh. 2012 was ranked number 14 on the list of the top 100 children's novels published by School Library Journal. Aww. Publication of the sequel, The Lord of the Rings, altered many critics' receptions of the work. Instead of approaching The Hobbit as a children's book in its own right, critics such as Randall Helms picked up on the idea of The Hobbit as being a prelude, relegating the story to a dry run for the later work. Kind of, right? Countering a presentist, and interpretation are those who say this approach misses out on much of the original's value as a children's book and as a work of high fantasy in its own right. And that in disregards the book's influence on these genres. Commentators such as Paul Kocher, Kocher and John D. Ratliff and C.W. Sullivan encourage readers to treat the work separately, both because The Hobbit was conceived, published, and received independently of the later work, and to avoid dashing readers' expectations of tone and style. While The Hobbit has been adapted and elaborated upon in many ways, its sequel, The Lord of the Rings, is often claimed to be its greatest legacy. The plots share the same basic structure progressing in the same sequence. The stories begin at Bag End, the home of Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo hosts a party that sets the novel's main plot into motion. Gandalf sends the protagonist into a quest eastward. Elrond offers a haven and advice. The adventurers escape dangerous creatures underground, which are Goblin Town or Moria. They engage oh, another... Goblin Town's in The Hobbit, and Moria's in Lord of the Rings, I'm assuming. I guess. They engage in another group of elves, Mirkwood and Lorth- Lothlorien. Sorry, Lord of the Ringians. Uh, they traverse a desolate region, desolation of smog and the dead marshes. They are received and nourished by a small settlement of men, the Asgoroth, the Asgoroth, and the Ithlithlian, 
They fight in a massive battle. Oh, the Battle of Five Armies in Hobbit and the Battle of Pelennor Fields in the other one. <laughs> Their journey climaxes with an infamous mountain peak, Lonely Mountain and Mount Doom. A descendant of kings is restored to his ancestral throne, which is Bard and then Aragorn. And the questing party returns home to find it in a deteriorated condition, having possessions auctioned off and the scouring of the Shire. The Lord of the Rings contains several more supporting scenes and has a more sophisticated plot structure following the paths of multiple characters. Tolkien wrote the later story in much less humorous tones and infused it with more complex morale and phys- phys- philosophical themes. The differences between the two stories can cause difficulties when readers, expecting them to be similar, find that they are not. No. Many of the thematic and stylistic differences arose because Tolkien wrote The Hobbit as a story for children and The Lord of the Rings for the same audience who had subsequently grown up since its publication. Which makes sense. Uh, further, Tolkien's concept of Middle-earth was to continually change and slowly evolve throughout his life and writings. Why not? The style and themes of the book have been seen to help stretch young readers' literacy, literacy skills. <laughs> Maybe we should read right. it. Right, <laughs> you've been getting, preparing them to approach the works of uh, Charles Dickens and William Shakespeare. Ooh, yeah, Shakespeare. By contrast, offering advanced younger readers modern teenage oriented fiction may not exercise their reading skills, while the material may contain themes more suited for adolescents. As one of several books that have been recommended for 11 to 14 year old boys to encourage literacy in that demographic, The Hobbit is promoted as the original and still the best fantasy ever written. Several teachings, guides, and books of study notes have been published to help teachers and students gain the most from the book. The Hobbit introduces literary concepts, notably allegory, to young readers as the work has been seen to have allegor- allegorical aspects reflecting the life and times of the author. Meanwhile, the author himself rejected an allegorical reading of his work. He said, don't say this is about me. Right. This tension can help introduce readers to readerly and writerly interpretations to tenets of new criticism and critical tools from Freudian Freudian, an, Freudian analysis, such as sublimination, in approaching literary work. Oh, that's nice. Another approach to critique taken in the classroom has been to propose the insignificance of female characters in the story as sexist. While Bilbo may be seen as a literary symbol of a small folk of any gender, a gender-conscious approach can help students establish notions of a socially symbolic text, where meaning is generated by tendentious readings of a given work. By this interpretation, it is ironic that the first authorized adaptation was a stage production in the girls' school. It's not ironic at all. No. The Hobbit has been adapted into many times for a variety of media, starting with the March 53 stage production by St. Margaret's School in Edinburgh. The first motion picture adaptation of The Hobbit was Jean Deitch's 1966 short film of cartoon stills. 1968 BBC Radio 4 broadcast an eight-part radio drama version by Michael Kilgariff. In 1977, Rankin Bass made an animated film based on the book. I think that's the one. Maybe I have saw like an animated older version or something. 1978. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was like a cartoon version. I remember a ring. Isn't there something? What are, what are, what's another one with the dwarf? Snow White. No. It's probably The Hobbit, yes. Uh, 1978, Romeo Muller won a Peabody Award for his ex, ex, for his teleplay. <laughs> a children's opera composed by Dean Burry appeared in 2004 in Toronto. Between 2012 and 2014, Peter Jackson's three-part live-action film version appeared on cinema screens. Several computer and video games have been based on the story, included a 1982 game by Beam Software. During the COVID-19 lockdown, Andy Circus read the whole of Hobbit to raise money for charity. He then recorded the work again as an audiobook with cover art by Alan Lee. Fantastic. While reliable figures are difficult to obtain, estimated global sales of The Hobbit run between 35 and 100 million copies since 1937. Between 35 and 100 million? <laughs> Jeez. In the UK, The Hobbit has not retreated from the top 5,000 best-selling books measured by Nielsen Bookscan since 1998, when the index began. Achieving a three-year sales peak rising from 33,084 in 2000 to 142,541 in 2001, 126,771 in 2002, and 61,229 in 2003, ranking it at the third position in Nielsen's evergreen book list. The enduring popularity of The Hobbit makes early printings of the book attractive collector items. The first printing of the first English language edition can sell for between 6 and 20,000 euros at auction. 
Because it's about pounds. or pounds, which is, is about pounds? yeah, which is about probably eight to twenty five thousand somewhere around there. Although the price for a signed first edition has reached over sixty thousand pounds. That's going to end it for this. Honestly, guys, I don't really care anything about this article. <laughs> it was stupid. This whole thing sucked. The Hobbit sucks. The Lord of the Rings sucks. The whole fantasy genre sucks. And I don't like any bit of it. And we uh, might record something different for next week's episode and put this out at a later time. So, But probably not. But uh, just know if you're reading this, are bad for mispronouncing shit. Because mm-hmm. this shit was a boring-ass article. I guess it you're going to get that from time to time when we're spinning a wheel. Speaking of spinning a wheel... Let's get it over with so we know what we're doing next week. All right, categories. Where are we going? Categories. Literature in English. It's going to be civilizations. Mm. Civilization. What are we going to do here? Don't be Sumer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that might be interesting. The Napoleonic Wars of 18... uh, Early 1800s. Cool. What's that have to do with civilization? There's all wars. Yeah. Civilization. That's how civilization is built. By wars? Pretty much. So, we'll be covering the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah, a bunch of more names we can't pronounce. Yeah, probably. But well, that's actually interesting because I don't think I've read too much on that at all. So, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll be back for then. Napoleonic Wars next week. And in the meantime, go check us out on the Battles of the American Civil War. Speaking of wars, where we are covering towards heading towards the end of 1863 and 1864, no less bloody. We're uh, winding down that war as we see the Confederates making some big mistakes lately and the Union getting the upper hand. And then we also got Outlaws and Gunslingers podcast wherever uh, you get your podcast or on YouTube at Bang Dang Podcast or on YouTube at Bang Dang Network where we release those every week. And uh, Outlaws and Gunslingers, we're in the middle of the mafia covering the Genovese crime family at the moment. So if you're interested in all that kind of history stuff and the uh, Civil War and mafia and next week the Napoleonic Ro- N- the Napoleonic Wars, keep it right here because we'll be back next week for some more. According to Wikipedia, we are the Mouth of Michiganders with Bang and Dang.